Good afternoon and welcome back to the Leadership Institute studios. I'm Kyle Bechet, Communications Manager here at the Leadership Institute. Our live webinar today is going to be a good one. Um, we're going to be talking about messaging. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about how candidates message, how campaigns message, and how we talk about issues in today's world. Um, and I'm even more excited because of our guest today. Uh, our guest is Stephen Sutton, the Vice President of Development here at the Leadership Institute, and probably one of our best faculty members here uh, at our many trainings. So I'm excited to have this conversation with him today about messaging and, and give a, you a glimpse of the many um, things we talk about here at the Leadership Institute training. Um, with that, thank you, Steve, for joining us. Thank you, Kyle. Pleasure to be here again. Yes, we, you are a regular at, uh, attendee of these webinars, so um, we're excited to have you back. But before we start today, I just want to remind everybody at home, let everybody at home know that uh, this is a live broadcast, but you can have your questions asked and answered on air. And you do that by emailing us at live at leadershipinstitute.org. Also, join in today's conversation on messaging by using the hashtag LIWebinar on Twitter. Um, and who knows, maybe we'll even throw you a retweet or um, get, get in touch with you about a training or something like that. Um, and after this event is over, uh, it, will be, it is being recorded, so we will put it on our Activism On Demand page. And if you stay to the end of the broadcast, I'll let you know how to get there. Um, with that, Steve, messaging, big topic. It is. Um, it should be. We were just talking off air that you talk about this for six hours at between the Campaign Management School and the Future Candidate School hosted here at the Leadership Institute. Give us a brief overview of, you know, not quite six hours, maybe maybe ten, six to ten minutes um, of messaging and, and what, what, you know, we can expect to talk about today. Well, today we're going to talk just in general terms uh, mm -hmm. at the Campaign Management School and the Future Candidate School. Uh, those are four-day schools, and so we drilled down into the, uh, uh, into the roots of really uh, specifically how to develop your message and then different ways to talk about it, and, uh, uh, and we'll get to some of that today, I think. Um, but I think it's the greatest challenge. It's you know, the old saying that uh, conservatives win every debate but lose every election, uh, and that's less true now than it used to be, but even still, uh, you, do, you won't win an election simply based on policy and mm -hmm. convincing people that your policy is, is better than the other side's. Um, there is, uh, it's all messaging mm -hmm. and branding, um, which is, and, and it's, it's, it's that is, a, one, is I think our biggest challenge mm -hmm. on our side. Uh, the left is much better at it. And it's not deceiving people or manipulating them. It's putting your best foot forward and describing things in a way that connects with people so that they can actually agree with you and vote for you right. uh, and support the things that you mm -hmm. want to do, but in a way that is convincing to them. Mm -hmm. uh, people will say, how do I convince people to vote for me? Right. And that's the key uh, um, challenge, is how do you convince them? And it's beyond issue persuasion. Mm -hmm. um, it is message development, and, and that's how you convince people. Right. Um, and, and so we're gonna, that's what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. um, the, the greatest challenge that we have is that we often are out-messaged by the other side. Okay. Because they're talking from here, and we're talking from here. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we're talking about uh, the benefits of different issues, uh, if we ever get to benefits. We talk about features of different issues. Mm -hmm. And we're so convinced that we're right that we expect people to uh, be persuaded by a rational presentation right, of, right. Our, of our issue uh, targets. It's almost and, and that's not what motivates people. Yeah. And in fact, it frustrates the left. They believe, incorrectly, that we've uh, duped all of these uh, uh, working class people to vote against mm -hmm. their own interests, right. as they define them, right. because we fool them with uh, meaningless issues mm -hmm. that convince them to vote against their best interest. Right. Um, but of course, they're voting against their own best interests in certain areas. Uh, but, uh, and, and so that's an mm -hmm. interesting discussion yeah. as well. As, as you were talking about, you know, it's like sort of that, that purity mm -hmm. argument where just because I'm right, therefore I'm going to win 100% right. of the time. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work that way. No, and I th there are countless examples where yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah, and, and, we'll, and, and I think yeah. we'll get into some of those examples right. today. Right. Um, but let's walk through some of more of the basics of messaging a little bit more. Right. Um, when you talk about messaging, what, 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 do, you, what do you mean? What, 
is it building you know a resume of credentials is it building you know an issue platform or is it something else it is definitely something else it's it's um, uh, in marketing in sales and marketing it's the distinction between um, advertising features uh, versus advertising benefits right uh, that's a distinction that many people uh, a mistake that people make uh, it's not uh, a benefit until the person who is the purchaser tells you that it's important to them and then it shifts from a feature to a benefit mm -hmm. otherwise it's just a litany of features <laughs> um, a, a car salesman you know you walk in and they start listing all the features right uh, and inside your, your head you're thinking well I don't care I don't care I don't care if you verbalize that maybe mm -hmm. they'll adjust but that's why they should be asking you what are you looking for instead right. of just attacking you with features mm -hmm. and at the point that you say well I'm looking for this this and this they say oh, well that's amazing that's this model right here it has this this and this mm -hmm. now those are benefits because you've, right. you've, you've so so how do you figure out what are are benefits to voters as opposed to features mm -hmm. and so part of that is focus grouping or just talking to people uh, uh, but you have to think of it in terms that will persuade them and the, you don't do that with a litany of features mm -hmm. what's important to somebody uh, and how you talk about it um, so for well, let's start with the old uh, adage that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care mm -hmm. and this is a, again a classic problem that our side uh, falls into it's, a, it's almost a trap of our own, mm -hmm. own making um, and and you have to show people you care I think that if, if I had to if I was forced to say what's the single most important thing that uh, conservatives need to do on the campaign trail and otherwise it is convincing people that you care the attack of the other side will constantly be be uh, we liberals care and as conservatives you don't care you care about yourself you care about the rich you don't care about us, mm -hmm. whatever that us may be. And so you're going to have to face that attack anyway. And that's why it's so important uh, that candidates have um, a certain um, level of uh, uh, in, in, their, in, their, in their district that they're running in, uh, a certain level of familiar, familiarity that people know who they are mm -hmm. and they have some name ID and hopefully positive name ID because it will make the attacks less likely to take hold uh, it will also show people that you care. Mm -hmm. um, voters can tell if you're running to do something or if you're running to be someone. Right. If you're running to do something, you should have, a, you should have done something. Uh, you know, we all know of the, the rich person who sells their business <laughs> and says, I'm bored, I think I'll run for governor or, or whatever. They usually right. go for governor. And, and so they're running to be somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you're running to do something, though, okay, you should be able to say, and look at what I've done. And by, sh by telling that story, mm -hmm. you're going to show people how much you care about the community. And hopefully there's some substance there. And, uh, and it, so that's what it takes. It takes being able to show people, everyone's going to say that they care, but can you convince people? Right. And then there's different ways to do that. Um, but uh, you have to tell them your story. It is not uh, what you've done. It's why you've done it. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, who you are. It's why you are that... that is what people really care about. And once you've convinced them that you care, then they'll listen to your solutions and they'll have some credibility. Uh, so the question is not what is your solution to mm -hmm. this problem. The question is why is that your solution to the problem? And that's what conservatives very, very, very often skip that part. They never tell, get to the why. Mm -hmm. The left always talks about right. the why. Compassion, caring, I mm -hmm. want to help people, I'm for you, mm -hmm. I'm fighting for us. And, and, and then they divide based on that basis um, where they're, they're in the majority mm -hmm. and they try to marginalize conservatives. Uh, we should think in those same terms because that is persuasive. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe this? I mean, I'm a conservative because I want to help people. Right. And then you make that case that, in fact, it's conservatism that has helped the most people make the greatest gains. Mm -hmm. And you explain that and how that's affected your life. And so if we get to that point, then we start winning and convincing people. So it's yeah. not just winning the election, right, right, right. it's winning the issue and mm -hmm. then getting the issue passed. Right. Going yeah. back, it's, yeah. you know, yeah, it's building, it's building a credible case for yourself and then going from there and then worrying about, you know, the platform issues right. that we all want to talk about. Um, you mentioned a lot about how the left does this well. Can you give us an example of some, maybe something that sticks in your mind about how the left did this well, whether it be a candidate or... I think you can find examples at every level of mm -hmm. uh, campaigns and politics. Uh, the left uh, does a very good job of this. They tell their own personal story, 
and then they put that into the issue. Right. They start with that personal story. Um, when people come to our trainings, they often will bring their campaign literature with them. Is this a good piece of literature? Um, you know, I'll save everybody a lot of time here. Uh, no, it's not. It's probably terrible. Right. And the reason is because when I look at the literature, if you could take your name off the literature and put someone else's name right. on, particularly one of your opponents, then it's worthless. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone in the Republican primary, for example, they're for, they're for lower taxes. Yeah. They have a very similar, on whether it's mm -hmm. on social issues, typically on, on abortion, and on death penalty, and on taxes, and on foreign policy. Uh, it, most cases, there'll be six people on stage, and all six agree. Yeah. So at what level will people decide you versus the other person? And that's where it becomes, why do you believe what you believe? What is basically your brand, but what's your story? I like to call it the because clause. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you support this program? Why do you believe what you believe? And the left always tells the story, um, how they were raised, uh, why they believe what they believe. Uh, and, and on our side, we're talking just, we, we talk about those issues, but we don't personalize them to our own experience mm -hmm. that can relate to other people. Um, uh, let me give a, an example just yesterday. I had a, someone running for office send me an email. So this was yesterday morning. Uh, this person ran for the Board of Education and lost, but they got 40% of the vote. They're running again, and they write to me, I've been appointed to the Commission on Testing. They ran for the Board of Education. I've been appointed to the Commission on Testing and the Board of Education, and I, have, uh, I was also appointed to the Liquor Board, and I think I have momentum to win. Uh, and then I'm working on a few priorities for my platform. This is exactly what's wrong. You didn't lose last time because you weren't credentialized enough. Mm -hmm. You're not going to out-credentialize the left. They're right. all about credentials. The reason you lost, I think, is because in none of this have you told me anything about your personal circumstance. Mm -hmm. If this person has said, I'm the parent of three with three children in the public schools, right. and that's why I want to serve on the Board of mm -hmm. Education, a parent for a change. In fact, that's a great slogan if you're running for right, a school right. board, where everyone on the school board is a teacher or, or an administrator, mm -hmm. and there's no one who's a parent with children in the school. Now, that might not be this person's specific condition, right? but if it is, how about a parent for a change? Yeah. And you're saying, shouldn't we have one person on the school board or on the board of education who's a parent whose children are in the, the current, st and a lot of people will do what you're doing and say, Yes, that makes a lot of sense yeah. to me. Yeah. And that's how you'll differentiate yourself from mm -hmm. everybody else. And no one else will be able to say that if it's truly unique to you. Mm -hmm. So you start to look at, the, your, you are, your biography is unique to you. Mm -hmm. Share that with people. No one else can say those things. Right. But other people can say, I'm for more education spending, or I'm for an end to teacher tenure, or on issue-specific things, thousands of people can hold that point of view. So you're not differentiating yourself. Right. But there's only one you. Um, I actually went through campaign strategy with Michelle Bachman when she first mm -hmm. ran for Congress. And that's when I learned that she was mother of five, foster mom to 20 plus. That is who she is. That's why she does what she does. And so it's such an integral and part of her. Mm -hmm. Nobody else can say that I'm a mother of five and a foster mom to 20 plus uh, children. Right. So it, it immediately knows, lets you know that she cares. You may disagree with her on specific issues, but you won't disagree with where she's coming from. And I want that kind of a person representing me. That's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And you haven't even gotten to an issue at that That's point. Right. Like, That's right. You know, in that, in that you were setting that up, I still don't even know what she stands for in right. the example you were talking about. However, you know, you got me saying yes right off the bat by saying, you know, um, she's a mom who wants, who... who if, if she's a mom. Yeah. Maybe she's not, yeah, but right, I don't right, know right, yet. Right, right. But I would like to know the biography, you know, the, mm. the biography. Right. I'm a mother of three. One of my mm. children has special needs. Uh, I, I'm a recent cancer survivor, or, or, or right. you know, I'm making these things oh. up, but whatever that uniqueness that shows a layer to you mm -hmm. as to who you are, to show people that I'm running because I care. Right. And let me show you and then you could talk about all these other things. I've served on the State right. Board of uh, Education, and I've, I've uh, been appointed to the Commission mm -hmm. on Testing, and there's a reason why that's important. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just a litany. Now, it certainly d d differentiates you. You may be the only one with those credentials, mm -hmm. but that's not where you start. Right. Okay, I'm the only one who is uh, a member of the Kiwanis and the Elk Club and the Raccoon Club, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and so I'm unique because I'm the only one a member of those three clubs. 
And that's not what I'm talking about. Um, uh, I, I'm talking about why do you belong to those? Let me talk about projects that mm -hmm. we've done. We've helped children or whatever it is those things, those organizations do and, and, and start there. Then when you bring in those other things, there's, a, there's that layer that underlies it of caring about people. Mm -hmm. And that's what will allow people to listen to your solutions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're not even going to listen. It, it's not more platform issues. It's, that's just more things for people to ignore. They're shutting you off, and this is the goal of the left, to shut off conservatives. Conservatives are so much out of the mainstream that their opinions are illegitimate, so we don't have to listen to them. That's the predicate for keeping speakers to, to speak on college campuses and everywhere else. That you're illegitimate, it's racist, it's white supremacy, it's homophobic, it's uncaring. It's so right. uncaring, we're not even going to listen to your solutions. So coming up with another solution doesn't help you. Mm -hmm. You have to break through that by showing that you care as much as they do. Never concede caring to a liberal opponent. You care just as much as they do. It's just that your solutions are different and then they actually happen to work. Right. You're care so much, you care so much, you're crushing the people you're trying to help because your solutions don't actually work. In that debate, we win. But if, but if you do it on their basis, we lose. Mm -hmm. And that's the frustration. And, and, and liberals could so, be, could yeah. be in you know, Republican primaries or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is, this is uh, uh, how you break through mm -hmm. against establishment candidates, rhinos, uh, or liberals in general, uh, and yeah. others in particular. Yeah. A couple, well, couple of points just to emphasize a few points you made. Right. You know, we talked in the pre-interview um, down in your office about uh, how if candidates with the best credentials won every time, I think we would have a few elections that went very differently. Absolutely. I mean, uh, right. Well, this, this last one. This before, last election, right. you know, alone, like no one can say that Hillary Clinton doesn't have a very long resume. It's just the most qualified candidate for president. Yeah. According to right, you know, yeah, whoever, President Obama and others. Yeah. She's the most qualified one. We yeah. have to vote for her. Right. Um, and no. you know, and and then if you look at the other side, George H. W. Bush, probably one of the more qualified. You know, served in almost every level of government. Right. Was well respected, very qualified. Lost to Bill Clinton in in uh, that election. Or how a, a two-year U.S. senator, two, yeah. uh, you know, Barack Obama can beat uh, Hillary first. Right. Certainly more qualified. Yeah. From the standpoint of her her resume, uh, and then John McCain. Yeah. And so, so that's not what voters are looking for. Mm -hmm. um, now you can point to examples right. where those people did win, mm -hmm. but I'm going to tell you that's not why they won. Right. Um, uh, Usually, and it's certainly not why you're going to win because right. you're running against the machine, whether it's a liberal machine uh, or the establishment machine. Uh, you are, if you're a conservative mm -hmm. running for office, most of the time you're trying to buck that trend. Mm -hmm. So you have to show a different layer to yourself, um, or you're not going to crack through. You'll win forty percent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which it's, is name on the ballot doing nothing. Yeah. yeah. You would have won. Having the, you would have won thirty-eight it's having, percent. It's having the idea after. In fact, when we we teach at the campaign management school and the future candidate school, how do you get from forty to fifty-two, fifty-three? Right. Because at forty, in, in, in a district that's winnable, name on the ballot's going to get probably forty mm -hmm. percent. If it's a if it's a competitive district that you could win. Right. Uh, and and so how do you break through that to get to a majority? Mm -hmm. You've got to convince those people in the middle who are not driven by issues. If they're driven by issues and they're liberals, they're not voting for you, as credentialized as you may be. You're not going to get them. How do you convince them to vote for you? Mm -hmm. and, and this is the way you do it. You have to uh, uh, open yourself up and uh, uh, explain to them not what you believe, but why you believe mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Uh, and that's when you start to convince people to listen to you. And that's when you can then get into some maybe policy details where they'll say, hmm, Okay, well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it's coming from a place of caring right. and a, from a place of wanting to help people. And that's why you believe what you believe. Mm -hmm. And then people will start to listen to you. Right. I think one more, I just want to bring up one more example. And then we actually mm -hmm. have a question from our at home audience that I want to get to. Um, there was one example that I think we both liked that we had talked about a, a bunch of times. Uh, state senator here in Virginia um, has a good resume behind him, but also has figured out a way to package that into a good argument. Um, that's State Senator Dick Black, who has right. had that you know palm card that talked about his record of service, right. lifetime of service. Right. Um, 
you know, and it's not just your run of the mill issue oriented slap whatever name you want to on to win a conservative primary type stuff. Right. Dick there. Black, uh, for those who don't know, uh, had a career as a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, how do you train? We have a lot of veterans that come through our training, and they have uh, an advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, once they understand not to concede uh, public service to politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we have several, often they come through, I'm running against someone who's been in politics for 20 years, how do I, f how do I combat you know, that they're the experienced candidate? I said, wait a minute, you have a military uh, experience and background. Right. You're as much a public servant. Everyone says, thank you for your service. Um, but you have as much of a record of public service as they do, it's just indifferent. Uh, we have several people who come through and end up running on uh, a platform, a lifetime of public service. It's just in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we see that now running for state office in Virginia. Uh, there are two candidates, one on each side, uh, who went to VMI. Right. And they, 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 they promote that prominently in their ads because it says a lot uh, to have graduated uh, from a, a military academy or from VMI. Um, because it's, it, it speaks to a person's uh, uh, commitment to public service, service to their country, honor and integrity, uh, character. Uh, it says all these things simply because they went to VMI. Uh, and I think it speaks well of them. It's kind of shorthand mm -hmm. for all the things that we want to talk about. Uh, it'll be interesting since they're different parties if they, if they both win. Uh, and that won't be the only reason, but mm -hmm. it's giving a layer to their record of public service and why they're running for public office because they want to continue mm -hmm. to serve our state and our country uh, because they want to put America first uh, because they love our country. And that's a powerful thing. And so hopefully people running for office that everyone has, uh, you don't have to be a veteran, but you have a story of commitment to the community, of community service, of community involvement, and you can tell that story. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite stories is a, a man who ran for city council in Nashville, Tennessee. And his background of community service, uh, he has two daughters and he started a, an all girls basketball league so they could play basketball. Mm -hmm. And so, and he went to referee school so he could ref the games. And uh, he had dozens of parents who wanted to help him get on the council. And it's a nonpartisan position, but still he had dozens of parents, scores of parents who wanted to help get him elected because they saw his level of commitment to the community mm -hmm. by starting an all-girls basketball league. There's nothing political about that. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a Republican league. It wasn't a Democrat league. Uh, it was just... It was a community league. It was a community league, and it was something for the community because he cared about his mm -hmm. children and he cared about the, the, the other girls in the, in the community. And parents, knowing of his character and that he would do these things, they actually asked him to run for office. Uh, he, he wasn't running for city council. They went to him and said, we need someone like you on the council, someone who cares about us, who cares about the community, who cares about our families, and is willing to act on that. And so starting a girls' basketball league was a way that helped elect him to city council. Now, mm -hmm. now I'm not saying everybody should go out and start a, a basketball league, but get involved in the community. Because mm -hmm. if you're trying to make the case to people that you're running because you care about the community, you should be able to give examples of your caring. Right. And the, the more examples that you can give with that as an explanation, mm -hmm. that's the your why, your that's your because clause. Yeah. I'm running because I care about the community. Mm -hmm. My evidence, and that's where you have to give evidence, those are your issues. And, you, and let's talk briefly about issues. Um, there's two well, actually, ways. we're going to go okay. into issues, All but right. I just want to stop you. And sure. let me just say, as an umpire, I oh, can relate right. to that. There you go. Uh, you know, Umpires like, make great candidates. <laughs> have you thought about running for city yeah, council, I'll Kyle? I'll have to keep that in mind as I am uh, out there umpiring games and, and getting yelled at by all those fans that, that love to come to Well, your platform could be three strikes and you're out. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so a couple questions from our audience here that I want to I want to get to. Um, first one comes from Don, who is in Florida. Um, he asks about. Um, so I just read an article that states that TV is still the most important, the most used avenue for information. As a grassroots candidate, how do I overcome that? How can he get his message out there and break through that? That's a great question because the answer uh, may be that you can't. Next question. What? No. Um, <laughs> that's true. Visual trumps everything else, no pun intended. And so um, now there are, there are ways to use social media to get a visual message out there. 
uh, and different people experiment with that. But it's still, um, it's a shot in the dark to make that successful. So you should have a component of that. You should certainly have your own website. You should have video on the website, I believe. And then you should also have uh, uh, creative ways, not kooky ways, there's, there's a fine line there, but creative ways to, uh, to get your message out uh, that people can access if they want to. And then experiment with other, other mm -hmm. uh, venues uh, to, to get that out. Um, I don't, I've worked with a lot of local candidates uh, who we can't afford uh, uh, TV. That's also why you should already have a name in the community, ideally, mm -hmm. before you run. I mentioned the candidate with the Girls Basketball League. He ran for city council. He was well known in the community already. Right. And so that is a tremendous advantage. If you don't have that, it's a big disadvantage. You might ask, why are you running? Um, then you could be accused of running to be somebody. If you're running to do something, you should have done something. I would, I would encourage people to get involved in the community and get a name uh, in the community before you run for office, ideally where they're asking you to run. Um, and, and, and then that softens the deficit of not being on TV. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to believe that if you're not on TV, it's a grassroots campaign, the other person's not on TV given resources that are equal. If that's not the case, and they're on TV and you're not, well, you know, you're, you're, you're going yeah, to have a problem. That's mm -hmm. going to be a, a difficult thing to overcome. Now, there are all ways to overcome that, and that's with a grassroots organization, if you have a grassroots organization. But that requires volunteers who are willing to walk doors for you right. and walk neighborhoods and knock on doors. And uh, in order to do that, they have to have loyalty to you you just started a girls mm -hmm. basketball league and they all want to help you or right, whatever the right, case may right. be that you've been involved in the community so much so that people are willing to put time to overcome the lack of money to buy ads right that's the, going to be the trade-off mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's possible uh, the higher up the ticket you go the less likely you can succeed it's difficult to run for you a senate running a grassroots campaign um, uh, but i've run or helped people run uh, city council races where we've overcome that all the time. Right. In primaries, it's fairly easy. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of primaries, the person with the most money, with the most ads, don't win because the ads are, are wasted on uh, people who aren't registered to vote and they're not going to vote in this and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a party primary one way or the other. And so, uh, in fact, in this campaign that I mentioned with the, uh, uh, the Girls Basketball League, the other side started doing radio ads. Hmm. Which was, we, we figured out, they wasted 99.995% of their money was wasted. because It was a special election. There were actually 35 council districts in Nashville, Tennessee. This was in Nashville. And they were just wasting their money. But they didn't know what else to do. They had not built an infrastructure of grassroots. And that's not something you could just... Yeah. Turn the faucet and, it, and, and out comes grassroots mm -hmm. organization. We had built that grassroots organization. So well, they're doing radio ads, which are rough to listen to, mm -hmm. but just ignore it. Right. There were people on the campaign who wanted to do radio ads to counter. It's like, you know what, they're wasting 99.99. Just, you know, let them waste <laughs> that money. We're going door to door talking to voters who are likely to vote in the special election because they're homeowners and, and uh, Long story well, short, we won 70-30 in what was a swing situation, swing district. 70-30. Because we focused bad. resources, but we had to build that out. And we built out a grassroots machine. Uh, and that's doable wow. at, a, at the local level. Mm. So, wow. um, so although you may not be on TV, there's ways to counter it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not the only thing you should do. So that's a great question because I think that it occurs in a lot right, of right. campaigns. 70-30 is... Pretty, you know, in your well, they helped example. Us. Well, yeah, in all fairness, <laughs> they, they uh, yeah. you, you have to give some of the wind to them. Yeah. Um, quickly, two follow, quick follow-ups on that. Um, dr you mentioned, you talked in your example a lot about drafting, being drafted to run. How right. often does that happen on the local level? And then my second follow-up is, you mentioned how difficult it is to, to organize a grassroots, um, and that's not really the topic we're going to talk about here today, but... but like, what are some of the resources available to, you know, study that one further and figure okay. out how to do that the grassroots? Okay, great questions also. Uh, um, well, the first part of that, being asked to run, um, I, I learned from uh, Newt Gingrich when he ran GoPack 20-plus mm -hmm. years ago, there, there was a, um, a progression 
that he recommended for the best candidates. And that progression was listen, learn, help, lead. And then he took you through all that uh, in, in a lecture, but listen to the problems that people have. Our girls want to play basketball, and th there's no way for them to do it because they can't join the boys' league for whatever reason. So listen. People will tell you what the problems are in their local community. Then learn. Learn what the alternatives are. Learn what different solutions might be. Learn what people, I mean, you're, you're listening and learning. The third part is help. If you care about your community, you help to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start an all-girls basketball league. And at the point that you listen, learn, and help, people will ask you to lead. It's one thing to run to the front of the parade. It's another for people to throw you into the front of the parade. You want them asking you. And so the best candidates are the ones that people approach and say, would you run for this office? Mm -hmm. We need you. We want you. Right. Because then you have a body of uh, volunteers, uh, donors potentially, uh, door knockers, uh, who will help you. Mm -hmm. And uh, this candidate who I mentioned, uh, he was like, I'm not running for no city council. And I don't want to. That's never what I wanted to do. But it got to the point where so many people were, were, were begging him to run, mm -hmm. he finally agreed to run right. for office. Well, that makes for a good candidate, although you want candidates to be enthusiastic. But, but, and he got into it mm -hmm. because um, this is what builds your organization outside of the party organization. It's great if the party is there to help you. Uh, but how many times do our candidates win primaries, go down to the headquarters, Democrat or Republican, I won the primary, I'm here for the list of volunteers, the list of donors, the list of yard sign locations, mm -hmm. and the party laughs at you. They're, yeah. like, they're like, we don't have any of that stuff. That's funny. And then you say, well, you're supposed to. Well, that may be, but they don't. Well, if you have all that stuff, then you could go down. If they have it, it's a bonus. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, you still have an infrastructure. And this candidate had an infrastructure, and he had done other things as well. And as I mentioned, he had scores of parents that wanted to help him get elected. And those were his volunteers. And then it's a matter of training. How do you go door to door? What's the literature you're passing out door to door? What's our message? What's our theme? And how are we going to raise the money? Mm -hmm. And people did fundraisers for him. I mean, it was really an incredible grassroots campaign. But that's the way it started. Uh, and and uh, as I mentioned, it was very successful. Awesome. Well, no, the second half of that was. Oh, about you. You mentioned how difficult it was for you to set up the whole grassroots organization. And I don't want to get into that topic. But that but plays I into know. that, though. Yeah. Right. It plays into that. It's not difficult if you've done things and people having seen you done these things are convinced that you care about the mm -hmm. community and they will want to help you get elected. Right. If you're not getting that, maybe you're running too soon. Mm -hmm. Maybe you shouldn't be running. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had people come back after trainings. I did everything that you told us to do. I did this. I tried to raise money the way you told us, and, and none of it worked. And I've answered that question, great. Because now you know you should never run for office again. <laughs> because Hard if, truth. But, but, but if, if you truly did everything that we told you to do, but you still didn't get the support, then the marketplace is telling you, you don't have the support. If you mm -hmm. don't have the grassroots support to raise money, knock on doors, yard sign locations, mm -hmm. and the rest of it, you don't have the support to win. Mm -hmm. You're not going to win because you have the best ideas. Everyone thinks, I stand for these things and I will right. get elected. You won't. Mm -hmm. you and, and maybe you shouldn't. Right. You know, it's funny because we have you know, two U.S. senators who have just decided not to run for re-election. Mm -hmm. And at least in one of the cases, they said, I can't win the Republican primary, so I'm not running. Yes, you, you cannot win the primary. What, is, what does that say? Voters you're admitting, don't want you. You're admitting that the voters don't want you. Well, that's not the fault of the system or, mm -hmm. or, the, or the, the person at the top. That's your fault. You know? So what have you done to so infuriate so many people that they do not want you to run for re-election? Yeah. And if you do, you'll get clobbered. That's your fault. That's not the system's fault. There's a lot of people who are running for re-election and they are getting the support. So uh, it's such an indictment on them when they're claiming it's an indictment on somebody else. It's not. Yeah. It, and, and, and that's a, another great example of grassroots support. And by the way, you've had six years at least in office to build your grassroots army. And you have failed to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for not running. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that is, that, you know, great examples there. Yeah. Um, do we need to say who those people are, or do you know who we're talking about? <laughs> I think we can leave those leave those in the uh, All right. in the dark for now. Um, 
So before we went off on this, we were starting to talk about issue messaging um, right. a little bit. So what? How does this change? How is this similar? Well, how does this? How does issue messaging? It's fit the in? next. It's the next piece of this. Yeah. There, there's two ways to approach issues. One are which issues do you talk about? You you can choose which issues to focus on in your campaign. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to do that. Now there's a current events cycle. You know, everyone today is talking about the uh, uh, the truck attack in New York City today, and so you have to you have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But most days, you can choose which issues to talk about. Now, the press may be pushing you to talk about certain issues, and that's the power of the press. They get to decide what's on page one. They get to decide what they're talking about. You see this played out every night on cable TV. You turn on CNN, you see what they're talking about. You turn on Fox News, you see what they're talking about. You turn, you turn on uh, MSNBC, and you see what they're talking about. They, the hosts of the shows, get to talk about the issue they want to. Mm -hmm. You have that also. So you can choose the issues you want to talk about up to a point, but you should give that some thought. You're not, you shouldn't be constantly in reactive mode. You could be proactive as well. So the first layer of issues is which issues will you choose to talk about? The second part of that is how will you talk about those issues? Once again, you get to talk about the issue in the way that you want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And you see this played out on TV. So if given the terrorist attack yesterday in New York City that killed eight people, I believe. You could talk about how did that person get in this country and they got in on the diversity uh, immigration program. Well, that's one way to talk about it. Or you could talk about funding for terrorism uh, protection, uh, the funding in, in New York City. You see both sides kind of planting their flags in different, in, 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 in different grounds. Um, but you have to understand that's what's going on and not let the other side dominate and not realize what they're doing, or you'll never talk about the issue the way you want to talk about it, or you'll never talk about the issues you want to talk about because you've let the other side drive that agenda. You have to be aware that's what's going on. Right. Right. Um, just moving along, we are running a little bit out of, on, uh, out of time, so I just want to get to a few other, sure. few other good points today. Um, you mentioned earlier that people come back to trainings all the time and tell you, well, I did everything you told me to do and we lost. Right. And that could be for a number of reasons, but the two major reasons probably, um, why can't I you know, take messaging, training, and then and go on and lose is A, they're in an unwinnable district. And that's just, Sometimes you know, that happens. that's reality. Right. You know, some districts are D plus 15 and up, um, or D plus R 15 and up, or it's about the climate. Right. How, how does cl or the, the climate... Or, or, or they ran a bad campaign and didn't have the resources. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. well, we but already talked about your control. Yeah. Things, uh, outside, things well, outside your well, control. Well, the climate's important. Um, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's a pendulum that swings both ways. Uh, if you were a Republican, conservative, Republican uh, in 1974, after mm -hmm. Watergate, uh, in, in, assuming it's a swing district and winnable, you were not going to win. Yeah. You, could, you could do messaging and thematic and all that other stuff, and that, that win was in your face. You're not going to win. And in, 20, in, in 2008, same thing. Uh, Republicans were losing everywhere because of the economy, and none of this mattered, quite frankly. Uh, you still do the best you can. Uh, and in 2010, though, mm -hmm. the pendulum swung the other way. Right. And you could have a lousy campaign and with a lousy message, but your name's on the ballot, and you're going to win. Mm -hmm. uh, Sadly, people who win under those circumstances think they're geniuses, and because they won, they do the same thing, and uh, what the tide washes in, the tide will wash out. <laughs> um, and 2014 was a big year uh, for conservatives and Republicans, right. same, same thing, the, the win was at your back. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but what you want to do is run the best campaign you can so that you can swim against the tide and, uh, and still survive in a, in a tough environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how you build winning coalitions long term is, uh, is that you survive the, uh, uh, the, the various uh, uh, current events that may swing back and forth. Um, and you never know when that's going to hit. Sometimes you do know, sometimes you don't. I mean, 2018 will probably be uh, a, a, a Democrat year. How big? Well, that's the question. Mm -hmm. And sometimes by running good campaigns, uh, you can mitigate right. uh, the effects of those, of those wins. Uh, sometimes you can't. Um, but you don't know usually mm -hmm. until the day after. You, know? right. you don't know that you're going to lose by three votes until the next day mm -hmm. or a week later um, right. and, and lament that 
half your campaign staff didn't vote because they were so busy working on election day. And, and that's happened. Uh, you don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's a, when it comes to, uh, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, when it comes to the whole uh, um, messaging thing, it can make a difference, but sometimes the climate just holds you back. Right. And those 90 or so Republicans that did win, you know, in after Watergate, they, uh, they had a message and they stuck to that message, presumably. Um, probably some of them were in districts that Democrats never had a chance of winning. Right. Um, but the ones that did win, you know, on the some of those swing districts, they, they stuck to a message and it did help them go against that tie. Probably. The, the other thing is sometimes you're affected and impacted by what the national message mm -hmm. is of the parties and right. of the candidates. And so it's hard to swim against that tide as well. Um, and so uh, if, if the dominant, well, typically it's the president, if the dominant political figure Let's just take current, uh, current yeah. events. Uh, president Trump is the president. He is the leader, the, the titular head, mm -hmm. but he is the leader of the Republican Party. Now, you may not like that. You may wish it were different or, or not so, mm -hmm. or you may love it and embrace it. Either way, though, it impacts your district. Right. And so to completely craft an independent message when there's a national narrative that's being driven every day from the White House and from the press secretary's podium, and it's, it's going to be very difficult to do that, um, which is why you typically sink or swim, like it or not, with what's happening at the national level. Now, in other countries, it's even more pronounced, where whatever the prime minister, if, if the prime minister wins, then, then you win, and if the prime minister loses, then you lose, and it's very difficult to have an mm -hmm. identity outside of the party. Right. In this country, there's enough independence that you can get away with that and try it, um, but that has to do with, you know, after years of branding, if, uh, if Republicans are taking a hit next year, but you've been in, in elective office for 12 years, chances are you're going to survive because you've had 12 years to build your brand mm -hmm. of independence, hardworking, caring, uh, or whatever that brand may be. This is why it's so hard to defeat incumbents. Uh, even in the early 1990s, uh, when there was tremendous turmoil in Congress in the congressional. It was still upper 80s, 86, 88 percent of incumbents won. Now, the turnover was from open seats. And you can argue many of those members decided not to run because they couldn't win. But nonetheless, I'd still rather be on the side of the 9 out of 10 who win, the incumbents, than hoping for the 1 out of 10 right. of non-incumbents or even in the open seat situation. So you, you do get an opportunity to build up your brand by being in office for a long time. Um, if, if you want an indication of what kind of year it's going to be, you can look at primaries. Mm -hmm. There are many primaries in the country where the winner of the primary will be the elected official on both sides. So who are people nominating? Um, you know, often in a Republican primary, in a Democrat primary, you'll have um, two state reps, one state senator, one mayor from one of the towns, uh, a GOP official, uh, maybe a, t a conservative activist, <laughs> and some rich guy who just sold their business. Right. And that's like the generic seven people that might be in the race. Yeah. Well, who's winning those races across the country? Back in the early 90s, it was the outsider. It wasn't the state reps or the state senator um, or even the GOP official. It was uh, the Tea Party or conservative type guy or the businessman uh, or the activist kind of guy. And it was consistent enough to show there was a trend. And then in the, um, in the years of the Tea Party, 2010 and, and 2014, who was winning? Um, initially, it was the outsider. But then it shifted because so many outsiders, once they got elected, we found out they were insiders and they were... And then, we, and then Tea Party and activists said, we can't trust these people. So now we want people with a track record of being as conservative as they say. Mm -hmm. So who started winning? The state senators and the state reps with long careers having done what they said they would do. I think that's what people were looking for. Not in every case. There's exceptions. But there was a trend. So Roy Moore winning in Alabama, the primary, what trend, is that a trend or an aberration? Mm -hmm. Well, then behind that, you've got Corker and, uh, and Flake not running for re-election. So I would say it's starting to be a trend. Mm -hmm. uh, is it an overwhelming trend? Is it a, a, an avalanche right. uh, oh. tidal wave trend? Well, we're not sure yet, but there's enough members 
who fit that model of being establishment and it being a detriment in the primary that three of them have lost. I mean, Flake and Corker uh, have already lost yeah. uh, without an running. election. They've been defeated uh, by this new trend. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say it's more than an aberration what happened with Roy Moore. It's, it's, it's a trend, how strong a trend we'll see. Um, but uh, but you, can, you can tell by what's happening before November of next year. We're already mm -hmm. seeing uh, in the tea leaves. And, uh, uh, and you see many Republicans retiring, and, and that suggests that maybe there's something going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're retiring yeah. Republican districts. The, the likely winner will be a Republican. Mm -hmm. So what's that saying? You know, what Republican incumbent doesn't run for re-election at the height of their political power? Mm -hmm. No, guys so, who don't think they can win the primaries, um, or they have a better offer elsewhere. Right, right, right. Case, But so. when they're looking at that trend, can right. they just pick? Uh, I don't think any. We would ever recommend that somebody take a mess, a similar narrative that somebody else has built around themselves, right. and then just ad lib it into your own. Because uh, right. then you're getting into the into the problem where you know you have that palm card again, where it's. It's cookie cutter. Yeah, it's, right. it's the same. Well, that's why you need to do both. Yeah. And, and you need to be conscious of the national narrative and the national trend, but then personalize it in your own way. If you do both, that's a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes it very tough for other candidates who aren't doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are the people who tend to win. Uh, that, that's who wins a 17-candidate primary for president. Right. The person who understands that, understands the national trend, uh, and sometimes it's lightning striking, and other times it's not. And understands branding. Who, who's the best brander of the 17 Republicans who ran in the Republican Party for president? The guy with his name on everything. I mean, he's yeah. a professional brander. And he picked them off one by one and just played them mm -hmm. like a fiddle. It's really a remarkable thing uh, to look at, and it's not just hindsight. When it was happening, you could see it if you understand branding and you, you understand mm -hmm. marketing and you understand talking from here and not from here. Um, and and uh, this is a guy who uh, went with his gut, but his gut's pretty good. Yeah. It's made him a billionaire. And, uh, uh, and, and that's why uh, the person who wrote uh, Dilbert uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Scott Adams and others predicted that, he, that, look out, this guy might win this thing mm -hmm. uh, because he really understands marketing mm -hmm. more than the other guys. Well, and, they, and, the, and the frustration is some of the other guys are pretty darn successful. By the way, I would suggest that the, 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 the person who understood marketing best of the other 16 was Ted Cruz. He understands marketing and, and uh, branding and, uh, um, and, and message development, mm -hmm. uh, I think probably better than the rest, which is why he ended up in second place, uh, I would argue. Yeah, it was kind of, you know, one of the things I took away mm -hmm. looking at that election is everybody who endorsed, you know, Donald Trump at, an, at a campaign rally, especially in the primary, would put on that MAGA hat right. and that Make America Great Again hat. Right. And it was, it was weird. It was like every single event did the same thing, but it works. So, um, and, and, and the president is able to get his message out by tweeting uh, just last night. Uh, he tweeted something about, uh, I think, tax reform, and every channel, it was on MSNBC as well, had a nice picture of President with the quote, he got to control the message, mm -hmm. and his whole quote from Twitter was on there, uh, or maybe it was about uh, the, uh, uh, the terrorist attack, but, but whatever it was, it was, a, it was a good message, it was tight, and it was busting through all of the clutter because it's the only thing. They didn't do a statement. They did it, he did it on, on Twitter. So say what you will, but he got that message out to tens of millions of people just by tweeting it, but then also an additional tens of millions of people by that's the only thing they provided, and he's, he's busting through the clutter. So he gets his message out, mm -hmm. I think, better than anyone in that position ever has. Okay. Yeah, I can't mm -hmm. disagree with you. Um, so my biggest takeaway from this webinar today is probably... Uh, it's not always about resume building or um, issue development. It's about building a personal narrative around yourself and that the rest comes in later. And showing people that you care. And care. That narrative needs to have that element mm -hmm. of caring about people and this is why you believe what you believe and then give examples. Mm -hmm. How the, the left, uh, you know, their, their slogan is every city like Detroit. Uh, and and uh, all these places where the most horrific uh, uh, ex experiences of our schools and uh, uh, is, 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 is based on a liberal model. Mm -hmm. How compassionate is that? So it sounds good. I'll concede that they have heart. It's just they have no brains. They're not, they, 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 and so that's a fight that we should uh, relish and we will win. We mm -hmm. have won it. Yeah. 
Uh, and hopefully we're, we're continuing to push that narrative. Moving the ball forward. Yeah. So I know you can go on for another five yes, hours I, Yes, about and this. I do. However. But in the campaign school. So. However, we're not going to do that today. Um, but as we mentioned, um, all of these, you talk about this at all of the trainings you talk about, talk, uh, are asked to talk in. Right. Campaign management school and the future candidate school being the biggest two. There's one in December. There's a future candidate school coming up in December. Great. Um, so for... If anybody at home wants to take or is interested in learning more about this topic or those schools, then go to our website, leadershipinstitute.org slash training. Um, they can register, find out more about the schools there and register for those schools there. And who knows, maybe you get to meet Steve Sutton in person if you've not already. I mean, he is a very interesting guy, that's well, for sure. Well, thank you. Um, and a Navy graduate, if you haven't noticed the... Uh, that's the, right. The, um, Go Navy. Beat Army. <laughs> Already beat Air Force. Well, we'll see how they do this year. Uh, I Steve, was at that game. See, very yeah. exciting. Uh, when, when I went, we used to say beat anybody. But now it's... it's <laughs> no, we, now it's, we, we, had yeah. de we had decent teams then. Right, right, so, right, right. But, well, uh, Steve, thanks right. for joining us today. Yeah. This was a great conversation. Great. Um, well, I hope everybody learned as much as I learned. Um, thanks for joining us. Terrific. Thank you, Kyle. Great. And thank you all at home for joining us today. Um, this was an excellent webinar. I, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions, but what I will do for you is I will send them over to Steve Sutton, let him see them, and he'll be able to answer them on his own time um, and let you know his thoughts. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. And uh, uh, if you leave your phone number with it, I might even give you a call to talk about it in more detail. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes uh, just a quick uh, email back and forth uh, doesn't really get to it. Right. Um, if you do, I'll return every email and every phone call. That is a promise. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Um, so you heard it. You can uh, have a personal conversation with Steve Sutton um, after this broadcast. And I have some of the questions that didn't get asked on air today, and I'll give them to him right away. Um, so thank you again for, all, for joining us today. Um, our next webinar is in the works. Um, we'll be looking at a campus focus next time, um, but I'll have more details for you on that later. Um, if you're interested, uh, when the time is right, uh, when, when we have it all, the details ironed out, it will be at leadershipinstitute.org slash live. Um, and you can find all of our webinar trainings there. Um, but if you want to view this webinar later or send this webinar to a friend later, um, it has been recorded um, and will be archived on leadershipinstitute.org slash activism on demand. With that, thank you for joining us on our conversation about messaging today. Um, have a good night and a good weekend.